Um, Sonakshi Chaudhary is a trustee at the Women of the Elements Trust, which she started with her mother in 2012. The trust provides free legal aid to women and children victims of domestic violence. Sonakshi is also an independent gender consultant advising several organizations on issues ranging from domestic violence and preventing sexual violence violence to preventing sexual harassment and encouraging gender equity in workplace. Thank you so much for being here uh, with us today, ma'am. Um, the session will be divided into two parts. One is uh, the main part, which will be um, um, ma'am's speech, and the second will be a Q&A session. Um, before we move forward, uh, any questions that you have for ma'am, you can, you can drop them in uh, the text box and we will pick them up eventually um, and we can start. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you for having me here today and giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I've been working in the policy advocacy communication space. And it's been about eight years now. So I'm going to start by talking about this journey because for some of that time, I did this without actually realizing that I was in fact in this space. So let me just explain that. I did my undergraduate degree in English literature right across the road from your institution, in fact, at St. Stephen's. And for the longest time, I was convinced that for a profession, I was going to stick with literature, um, studying the cusp between romantic and Victorian literature. This was clearly not what happened. Um, in 2012, during my second year of college, my mother and I started The Woman of the Elements Trust. It's named for her for first book. And it's to provide free legal aid to women and child victims of domestic violence below the income capacity of rupees 5,000 per month. Back then, I did not think of this as advocacy or work because I think it was so personal for me that I didn't know where my life stopped and this began. Um, the reason for this is actually that my mother walked out of a violent marriage when I was nine years old. For a long time, I did not have the words with which to express it or even to start to grapple with it. And when she first began speaking about it publicly, I remember both my brother, who's actually on this call today, but both him and I um, used to look at her and ask, you know, how can you say these things in public? And looking back now, I think it's only when I started to shift up my career aspirations and move towards policy that it started making more sense to me. Um, the fact that public policy also encompasses what is traditionally thought of as private. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have laws and policies and schemes and judgments that literally reach out into our homes and affect change. So pulling back out, today's topic is gender and public policy, intersections and challenges. And this is extremely interesting to me for two reasons. The first is that as a former literature student, my first instinct is always to deconstruct the topic. You know, ask questions for the question and question your bias. So I started, I'm going to start by saying this, that gender should ideally be the lens that you cast on all policy right? Because no part of our lives is divorced from it. It's in itself the greatest intersection and challenge when you talk about policy, at least to my mind. And that aside, um, the second part of this is that if we are looking at challenges and addressing gender requirements and policy, um, each of them circles back to something I've spoken about just before this, which is um, the notion of the private. I've had the privilege of working across a number of sectors. And to be honest, this was not always a conscious choice. I kind of fell into some of it. Um, but it has taught me that different institutions approach the issue of gender very, very differently. And each one has its own challenges that we need to be contending with. But for each one, interestingly, when I was sitting down to write down my thoughts on what I would speak about today, um, what connected these approaches was just the one thing, and bar none, it all circles back to what we consider private. Um, and this is personally given what I do for me the most important. I understand that, and I'm going to limit this talk to things that I can actually speak about with a certain amount of authority. I don't want to come here and give you, you know, these are, I'm sure that now, particularly with the pandemic, with everyone having these classes online, you would have 
dealt with so much information overload constantly. So I'm not going to try and throw random facts at you and say this 33% reservation bill and X, Y, Z thing. But really try and foreground this in my own experience to say these are the reasons why I think this one thing is something we need to be thinking about when we're talking about gender and public policy. Because the private really informs every single public approach to policy. And like I said, this is the intersection that I'm personally the most invested in. Um, so I'm use, going to use examples from my own career to, to talk about this and inform this discussion. But there is the very obvious one, right? With my trust, I work with domestic violence. Um, I started actually in my second year of college. When I said 2012, I was still 19 years old when my mother and I started doing this. Um, and we do this in a country where, according to National Family Health Survey data, um, one in three women face violence. This is even prior to the pandemic. So every third woman faces at least some form of domestic violence. 52% of women and 42% of men in this country believe that it is justified for a husband to hit his wife. So we're contending with that, which is clearly the cultural sort of underpinning that exists behind a really major gender issue. But over and above that, we also have a civil law around this, right? The Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act of 2005. Interestingly, then, it is one of those things that reaches into what was previously considered private. And this scope of this act is in itself an acknowledgement that violence is not a private issue. So even if you read the act as a layperson, I really would encourage everyone to do that because you'll find that it resonates with several international instruments around this as well. Everything from CEDAW to the Beijing Platform for Action. And in its understanding of how domestic violence is very much a human rights issue in the public, one of public importance, um, as we would say. So the mechanisms that exist within the law, everything from protection officers to, you know, uh, the kinds of violence that are laid out, they are meant for the purpose of ensuring safety in the private. Today, with the pandemic, um, access to safety has become a huge issue. And I'm sure all of you would have been reading the reports that have been coming out about this. But there has been an increase in escalation and escalation in domestic violence. So with this, you're seeing state governments across the country, um, they've all followed up with, you know, these really necessary shifts in emergency reporting. But equally, um, it needs to move into what we need to answer over long term protection or what we would say long term social protection systems that, you know, unfortunately are not at the level they need to be at for long term change. So this ties into my second example, which comes from my time at the Ministry of Women and Child Development. I worked on the Swadhagra scheme, um, which is a scheme for transitional shelter homes for women in difficult circumstances. And this to me was perhaps like my biggest learning curve to understand how governments are approaching social protection. Um, so part of my job was liaising with the state governments and union territory administrations to you know, look at the dispersal of funds from the center because it's a centrally sponsored scheme. So the center allocates a certain amount of money and this, the states each give a certain amount as well. And that's how the funds are basically dispersed. And this was changed recently through the Niti Aayog. In 2016, I think the change was made. This was made centrally sponsored rather than centrally sectored. The difference between both kinds of schemes is that central sector schemes specifically are disbursed directly by the center and there's not so much state involvement. So the money goes out directly as opposed to um, centrally sponsored schemes, which the state has a certain amount of stake in. So in the scheme that I was working on, it was 60-40 for states and um, the center and the center giving 60% of the share. And in certain states, it was 90-10. As certain states and union territories, it's stuck to 90-10. But um, coming back to what I was doing over and above just the fund disbursement, because that's one aspect of it, where you give the money to the states to be doing the work that they need to be doing at an implementation level. Um, I was actually called in to look at reworking the scheme guidelines from a gender responsive perspective. So, you know, re revising the existing scheme um, for shelter homes in line with what we would say would, were more current issues that we were facing at the time and creating standard operating procedures for them. Um, 
and through that, I think it was here that I realized that schemes and policies can and they should be updated regularly because the challenges that society faces at any given period are different. Um, but more importantly, because gender relations change over time. So yes, gender and power are skewed in a, an unequal fashion and yes, patriarchal society, but there has been a shift in the way in which gender in society operates over time, right? So I feel that even though it's important to let these changes take effect, because um, it's not one day you will change a policy and everything, like you've overhauled an entire system, it's not going to happen the next day. And this was something that was very hard to swallow because as a young person you go and I was much younger than the average consultant when I was working, I was about 24 or 25 when I joined the ministry. And then the other people and uh, the other consultants who were hired at the same time as me, the youngest person there was 32. So again, considerably younger people look at you slightly differently when you're slightly younger. But um, I think what I understood through all of this was that I spoke to various different state government officials and the sheer vastness of the country's needs and the sheer difference in the problems faced by each region, um, it was never more apparent to me when I started to make these calls where there were language barriers. Now I speak four languages and even so, despite being able to speak in Punjabi and Bengali, I was still having like issues, you know, listing all of the problems that people, because there are certain words for which you do not have a direct translation. And where do you start to understand problems when you're getting state government documents in a different language that you have to send back for translation and then they come back? So the sheer diversity that you're dealing with in a country that is as incredibly diverse as the one that we live in is something to think about. Um, and the central government really has a lot of work, you know, just to, to be grappling with that. The other thing was that I can sit in the central government and consult on like gender lens on issues till the end of time. And I can say, you know, oh, we need to be gender responsive. But how each state is going to go about implementing this policy is also dependent on a host of factors. So for any policy to be effective, right, there's a need to consider what are the requirements of every state. And those tend to differ depending on region. Um, and coming back to the, the private argument, it's that the particular social protection scheme that I was working on for social for shelter homes, it considered the private as being something that is in the public interest. So not having shelter homes is a problem for the state, right? Because for women who access these homes, the public is necessarily private. So again, just something to think about. And this really carried on even in my time at the Women in Labour podcast. So that's my third example for you. Um, I had a chance to interact with issues surrounding women in work. And firstly, work is a contested definition. I'm going to start with that. But if we see work outside the home as being uniquely tied to the situation that exists culturally inside our homes, um, I think that's a really important starting point for gender and policy because it was this understanding that, um, you know, it informed a lot of my work. I was research and editorial lead for this. So coming back to my first love, which is to be able to do research and to write as much as possible. Um, the podcast itself was about India's declining female labor force participation rate. So I don't know how many of you know this, but India is among the lowest in numbers. Um, we're at 20.54% of India's working age female population prior to the pandemic is in the labor force in the, I mean, and not in formal work and any of that, but in the formal labor force, 20.54%. Now this estimate has dropped even more during the pandemic and we're seeing this, uh, these numbers. And it's a terrifying reality to sort of grapple with because I started by, you know, mentioning this at dinner parties and I'd go and tell one sweet uncle somewhere and I'd say, you know, this, it's a really big problem. So, you know, the number of women in the labor force is declining. And I would get uh, this look that you're a complete lunatic. There are so many girls in my office, dear. What are you talking about? And really, I think this forced me to, to go back and consider how this issue needs to be presented for people to even see it as being an issue. And I started reading many economists and sociologists on the subject. And recently I've had a chance to write with and work with one of the economists whose work I referred to during this time, Natali. Um, she's the curator of the Global Shapers Hub New Delhi. 
and is incidentally also from your college, but she's written a book on the issue. And it was very multi-layered in its response. So for me, I think it was wonderful to stumble upon people close to me who were using different aspects of research. In her case, like, you know, hard quantitative data, something that is not my personal skill set, like by any stretch, but asking the exact same questions and presenting answers in a very, very different, more nuanced fashion. And coming back to the podcast, my job then was essentially to distill different academic opinions to open the issue up to a wide audience. If you've worked in, uh, in policy prior to this, and I used to work at a think tank, um, it's hard to do that when you think in terms of issue brief, like na hai, occasional paper, like na hai. you know, you're told that these are the things you're supposed to do. And one of the skills that I started picking up along the way was how to write in a more accessible fashion. So while the research component was definitely influenced by my own work, um, the podcast process really un like nuanced the way in which I approached this, um, just in terms of presenting those challenges to a wider audience. Because again, like I said, we tend to think of policy as being this niche thing, but it's not. It's very much informed by every single person that it reaches. Um, and one of the first things that struck me while I was doing all of this was that while I was at the ministry, I'd been really, really excited about um, the Maternity Amendment Benefit Act, right? It's a very generous and well-intentioned policy because it allows for 26 weeks of maternity leave. And when I started working on the podcast and I started speaking to people who were experts on the issue and hearing and learning a little bit more about this, um, I was made aware of the fact that India remains one of 90 countries in the world that has no national policy on shared parenting leave, right? So the implication of this is that institutionally, the role of fathers in caregiving is not afforded the same sort of importance that maternal care is. The unintended consequences of this were far worse, though, because companies are now growing far more reluctant to hire women, particularly given that this is not leave that is subsidized by the government, right? It's happening even today. We're hearing reports of women not reacquiring jobs or not recovering their jobs lost during the pandemic at the same rate that men are. Um, and part of this is because just for a company's bottom line, it's become far more expensive to hire women. And now the absolute like clear thing to me is that while governments can and should push for policies that help people, specifically gender responsive policies, they also need to be actually gender responsive rather than merely well-intentioned. And coming back to the last part of this, which is private sector organizations, because like I said, um, you know, this is, it is about who this policy reaches at the end of the day. One of the things that I do uh, is consulting around the prevention of sexual harassment. I sit on internal committees as an external member, and I also help organizations set up their compliances. So I've personally never worked with any organization that puts its bottom line or business over gender interests. But I can understand that in the current context of work, there are organizations that are thinking, well, you know, it's really not worth the hassle, specifically to hire women. It's just not worth it. Because first you worry about maternity leave, then creches, which are also stipulated under the same act and are the responsibility of the employer, according to a reply that the ministry just gave recently, the Ministry of Labor and Employment, that is. And the third thing is now you have to consider the sexual harassment implications, right? Um, and this is perhaps why the private sector needs gender specific public policy the most, the absolute most, because there needs to be a shift in a cultural understanding that we cannot reproduce tired old ideas of what it means. Well, firstly, women's safety or even any of this, this cannot be the repository of other genders. Um, it's not something that is the responsibility of the people that are, you know, that you are attempting to help. This is very much the responsibility of the stakeholders involved. And lately, I think smaller public policy firms have really got their finger on the pulse because they're working with the private sector. They're working with the government as much. They're working with civil society organizations. And I think it all comes back to the fact that policy does not exist at the ideation level. As any policy professional will tell you, a policy is not worth the paper that it is written on if it's not working for its intended targets. So really what I'm coming back to is that gender in public policy is about considering every one of these actors um, within this spectrum because it 
percolates to every single one um if you do get a chance to please try and cast your net as wide as possible um this has been you know precisely the sort of time that has allowed us to think about some of these things um and yesterday was actually the uh, international day for the elimination of violence against women and i brought this up in another webinar that i did yesterday that particularly in the context of covid-19 uh, it's imperative to take stock of the fact that this pandemic has not been equal um gender has been one of the variables that has dictated how countries have reacted to the pandemic um which is why now more than ever we need gender disaggregated data for instance and gender responsive mechanisms but it's also laid bare what we know as structural violence or the violence of the fgd um of systems that are not currently geared to deal with the sheer magnitude of the problems that they are facing down and i think this is where this needs a lot more conversation because you'll find a lot of scholars and policy wonks now they'll talk to you about how gender needs to be mainstreamed across the sdg 2030 agenda and i think this is partly because it's an it is an imperative for the other outcomes that we're hoping to achieve right because gender has the potential to alleviate health outcomes to create stronger institutions we've seen this during the pandemic in terms of just female leadership across the world um in fact education so educating women has been shown by the unicef to improve overall outcomes for health in households for instance so looking forward then i think it comes back to the fact that our realities do not exist in silos and therefore policy conversations cannot be isolated from that it's going to take governments it's going to take the private sector civil society everything even individual households matter when we talk about public policy and then only we can start to address something that scope is so vast that it's no longer just one item on an sdg agenda it's like an entire future that we're thinking about and with that i'm quickly going to close because i think there are a lot of questions i've got a lot of questions so i'm going to hand it back over to you Okay, so we can start taking the questions now. Um, the first question we have is from Shivani Bhargava. She says, "Ma'am, how can representation of women in the workplace be entered without reducing it to tokenism?" Wow. Okay. Um, I think this comes with an absolute sort of shift in policy, really, and. but overall an entire sort of and what you're talking about right tokenism tends to be that you tell yourself okay 33% or 50% of your population and i i see what you're referring to but i think we do need to start somewhere so yes um it's going to take more than just a reservation to change the way in which we approach representation of women in the workplace but equally i think we do need to start thinking about things like and this was something we spoke about at the webinar yesterday also but just in terms of procurement from women led enterprises just in terms of more entrepreneurship or investing in women led startups these are all things that we can do um and that can be done i don't personally um see it as being a problem if we do start with these measures because you're not going to change the culture of a society or an entire way of thinking overnight but you will be able to change the way in which women are able to approach work um and are able to even access some of these institutions i've actually written a five part series for outlook magazine i can drop it into the um chat box and you can read it because i've spoken about a lot of these issues that you're asking about and everything from um the factors that are keeping women out of the workplace to some of the things that we do need to think about um everything from access to opportunity to agency these are all conversations we need to be having on this so yeah and uh, the next question we have is what are the social cultural factors you need to india that make women vulnerable to domestic violence there are no social cultural factors you need to india that make women vulnerable to domestic violence this happens across the world um you'd be shocked actually at some of the statistics that you see even out of latin america for instance none of this is completely unique to any india anyone who says that this is a cultural problem or it is only a cultural problem needs to see culture as being bigger because um every place has a culture right so 
during the football season in the UK, for instance, the rates of domestic violence go up when certain teams lose. Now, nobody says that this is um, the culture of the United Kingdom because it's not. And in the same way, um, there is no culture to India that is specific that is making domestic violence, um, you know, making women in India more vulnerable to domestic violence. Yes, we are seeing across the board that everywhere in the world, the rates are rising during um, lengthened lockdowns. And we are seeing rates, um, and I mentioned the one in three data, right? That one in three data point is not specific to India, actually. Um, that's according to the National Family Health Survey. But over and above that, if you look across the world, the WHO numbers on this are exactly the same. It's one in three women across the world. And that is only reported violence. We don't know how much unreported violence. This is only like what we would say is the tip of the iceberg. So when we talk about social cultural factors, I don't think that it is fair to say that um, there's something unique to India that's causing domestic violence. Um, our responses to it need to be nuanced and we need to be thinking about it. And yeah. Uh, the next question is, how far do you think Indian public policies have been successful in creating a level playing field for men and women? Is it seen as an extra burden for the state funds or a disinterest in reforming the basic structures of work? Okay. So I think some of this I covered when I spoke about the fact that to a great extent, the intention behind a lot of these policies that exist has been to level the playing field. Right. We have been thinking and not we, but the, the government specifically um, has been thinking about ways in which to level the playing field. Um, and that being said, the 33 percent reservation that I've been speaking about hasn't happened. It hasn't been pushed through parliament and it's not really high up on the agenda. So I think this question is therefore in two parts, because one is the intentions behind the policy that is created. and. The next is the actual result of that policy, right? Um, when it comes to just in terms of the things that we that were thought would level all of these playing fields, I think we need to go back to the drawing board on some of these issues. And that's things like um, the maternity benefits, for instance. When you stipulate that the crash is going to be near the um, workplace, that's a great thing because it means that either parent can uh, take their child to work and have a crash nearby, right? It's You're saying that institutionally, that's not an issue. And then in the same, um, if you read the, the contents of, of the um, act itself, it says something along the lines of the mother should be allowed to visit the child four times a day. It does not say the parent. So clearly you are affording a differential in the way that you're thinking about who is approaching that social protection, right? And institutionally, then you're saying there is one person that is involved in the raising of this child, and that person is the mother. And that is the tip off point that we are seeing even for women in work. Um, it's when after the first child tends to be the, the largest, what is often, and I hate this phrase, but they call it a leaky pipe. And that's the pipeline, that's the point at which women start leaking out of. Um, Again, it's a terrible, terrible way to put it, but it is exactly what's been happening is that women at those levels are the ones that are dropping out of work. Um, and that's really something to be considering. How is it that we can make these systems slightly more positive? Um, a lot of that will involve a, a reconfiguring in the way we culturally understand women's work. Um, right? It's not the onus of one gender to be raising children. It's not the onus of the other gender or or another gender really um, to be ambitious. It's these are not gendered issues. These are things that exist right across the board. So how is it that we can stop seeing these as being the purview of a particular gender and make this slightly more genderless? And that. I'm afraid does not have a clear answer because it is going to take years and years of unlearning um, of the way in which we sort of internalize certain biases. And only then we can start sort of moving forward on this. Right. Um, policies have been addressing urban gender problems and neglecting exclusively rural women issues like honor killing, witchcraft, tribal traditions that kill women, genital mutilations by the, the Dawoodi community. Um, what would you have to say on this? 
Okay, so this is not my personal area of work. And I'm not going to, I always refrain from trying to broad brush anything or to claim expertise over things that I do not fully have the capacity to be answering. Um, like I said, it's, it's not my area of work, but my understanding of a lot of this comes from the fact that, yes, um, there is a tendency to see certain things in terms of what we're seeing on the news about the urban sort of workforce or we're seeing about urban women, really. And I do understand your point, but I think this is where civil society becomes twice as important because you do see organizations that are doing exactly this research. You've mentioned the Daudi um, Khatna ceremony, actually. And there are people that are doing this research that are working in various parts of the country and trying to come up with all of these solutions, taking it to government and taking it to various branches of government. Um, you will find more and more that there is an engagement with policy at that level. Um, but really that is going to come and not all push can be top down. In fact, the one thing that any development study student is ever taught is that you cannot see any of these problems as being like top down. This is not this is not just about trickle down. A lot of this is about participatory governance. And a lot of that means that all of the suggestions that come from um, the bottom up those are the ones that are, you don't bring development to a people. You don't just say that, oh, now we're going to solve these issues by giving you, you know, 10 policies around um, these issues that are happening at the ground level. That's not how any kind of grassroots participation in policy happens. And you will find that even for things like domestic violence, for instance, the push has come from civil society. It's not been that the government's woken up one day and said, okay, let's legislate on this. That's not how it's happened. It's been years and years of sustained movement, sustained push for change and reform. And that's actually how some of this has come about. So I do think that that is where, um, what I was talking about, like a broad spectrum of actors, that is when that will begin to change. And you are seeing more and more scholars get involved with that. Yeah. Why does no one talk about gender as a fluid in policy circles? Or, for instance, educating people about asking personal pronouns before addressing anyone. I know about things that are being done for inclusion of the LGBT community, but is it enough? Something I haven't heard about, if they do, maybe. Okay. Um, that's a really important question. I think the first thing you learn when you study any kind of gender studies is precisely about the fact that gender is a spectrum. Um, unfortunately, when you think about policy, at least from certain government circles, or you think about it in, you know, um, even in private sector organizations, you will find that there is a tendency to avoid things that are more confusing than, you know, the very obvious solutions. Um, and that is definitely a bias in the way that thinking happens in circles like this. The reason I have not spoken about the spectrum specifically here is again like um i do not feel confident enough to be able to say that you know i can legislate on this or i can talk about a lot of these issues i do believe that part of this is about passing the mic and more and more and this happened when i wrote a paper actually about trans uh, rights in india and i wrote a social legal analysis and at the end of it the person i co-authored with she and i sat down together and realized that we were thinking about it as cis hetero women. And we did not have the full sort of gamut of understanding to be able to even address these questions, right? And that's just one kind of um, this thing in, in terms of gender, but like even when you talk about intersectional identities, to speak for something or to be able to um, talk about things that you don't have the I don't even know if it's the right to, to be speaking about, but it's, I genuinely do not believe that it is the place of anyone who does not fully understand the, the issue to be speaking for someone else. That's the first thing. And I realized that this may be a fault in the way that I'm looking at it, and that's entirely possible. But I do think that it is important that we think about inclusion and diversity as more than just um, a policy that you write down. One of the, the best things I've read about this, at least bringing it to the private sector, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the India Culture Lab, 
um but parmesh sahani and his team actually came up with a wonderful manifesto for inclusion of trans persons at work um and i don't know if it was just trans persons i mean i referred to it for the the trans persons paper that i wrote but i know that it was for inclusion of the lgbtqi plus community um and yes it's a really simple step to to ask someone their pronouns before you start to address them but i think that's where our generation as a whole um differs from the one that happened before it every generation and my mom said this at at a webinar yesterday but every generation that comes um next has a chance to be a little bit better a little bit more empathetic a little bit smarter a little bit more aware of the choices that we're making and every generation thinks it right like we we've, we've invented this we know better we'll do better and i think that, that step is about doing a little bit better so yes for all of us to be creating that sort of space where people are able to express whatever identity that they choose um to express at any given point i think that is what we're going to see in the future and i hope that um we can bring uh to various sort of things not just work uh, but even academia even i mean you hear this from a lot of people that are writing in the academic spaces that they don't always feel fully comfortable with uh, expressing their identity as a gender identity specifically um when talking about this because again it becomes about who has the right to talk about certain kinds of experiences and the answer is always the people who are experiences experiencing those things so yeah okay the next question we have is from yashovardhan singh he says we see the government encouraging women to participate in the workforce through employment in companies and having policies such as prohibition of sexual harassment compulsory presence of crutches maternity leaves etc but this is this attempt to make their employment in offices comfortable is seen as an impediment and unnecessary effort by the companies themselves as a result many companies don't consider it worth the effort to employ women so is there any way to overcome this contradiction and i would just like to add to this that this is something that i've personally seen when a lot of private companies you have women working in specific departments for example human resources but you won't have as many women in say sales or you know um departments which are considered to be um more aggressive uh and um this is something that personally disturbs me and i don't know where to put the onus on um but yeah i think it's a little bit of everything i again this was the fourth article that i wrote in this series which was about bias because one thing is institutional bias which you will see outside it is in the selective procurement of certain kinds of services so exactly what uh, has been spoke has been asked um you know you'll see women in certain specific roles um you'll say that this is and again i'm saying women but you know i'm mostly because that is what my area of work is um i work with women um and i think a lot of that has to do with the way in which we've internalized gender roles um even ourselves i know that there is a, for me at least i've i've often felt this tight rope of being almost too aggressive in certain i i you know you'll hear things like you need to be a little bit humble you need to be a certain way you need to assert yourself a certain way and you know aise aise nahi but just thoda sa aise and you adjust who you are to suit this situation that is already asking of you all of these things anyway right um and you you either sort of adapt to that st uh, status quo or you or you work outside of it and there's you're always told that there's one of only two possibilities so i completely agree with what you're saying and i spoke about um this question through the course of this right is that there has been of course a very unintended consequence of all of these things yes it has become far more ex expensive for companies as a proposition to hire women um but you will find and this is something i've noticed when i'm working with msmes specifically right smaller companies and and ones that have that are family run um and interestingly one that i did a session with just before the pandemic ended and i sat down with the owners of this company and they said you know we have an entire sort of factory unit that is going to be just women and i asked them why and it's like you know let the the 
industry in which you're working, there's not a lot of women artisans. So why is it that you want an entire sort of unit? Just for my understanding, I want to know why this is the case. And they said, you know, you often hear these arguments about productivity and you hear that men are perhaps more productive or more capable of doing certain things. But we've actually found that there's no sort of difference and women are putting 110% in the same way that um, anyone else is. And the one thing we want to do as an organization is to take a step back and think about the fact that investing in women makes good business sense. Um, and the reason for that is that you're not uplifting just you know, um, women, you're uplifting entire families and you find that that is the, the thing that people are finding more and more in terms of investing in women. Um, and this is, of course, the example of a really small enterprise, but there's also like, you'll see in the garment sector, for instance, 70% of women employed in the garment sector are women, um, right? And like you said, this this does seem to be a, a, a procurement problem in that if you're hiring in a particular sector just um, specifically for this thing and then you're seeing leather work on the other side which is largely men you are saying that there is a gender bias in the way in which you're procuring um and all of these things said and done i can't tell you that there is a, a complete solution to this right because how are you going to change an entire mindset which genuinely believes and is not willing to even cure the side that it might be slightly different you'll also find this in positions of authority not just in this thing so you'll find maybe there are a lot of women in the workplace but you will find that in positions of authority more often than not they will not necessarily be women and that's something that the government is definitely trying to push in terms of some of the policies. You're seeing the push in the Companies Act for women on boards, for instance. So now it's mandatory to have a certain number of women on your boards. Uh, and the idea behind this is all to say, you know, let's um, increase women's participation at that level, at decision making levels, because agency and the ability to make decisions is going to impact the way in which um, gender is played out in at work. Um, and here is the double-edged sword of that, is that when you do that, then automatically you have these hazard questions about women's capability to be doing precisely that work. Because then you say, okay, this is tokenism. And at what point do you stop or try to explain this to an organization that is not sort of willing to, to see a gray in this? It is either black or white for a lot of organizations. So. Part of working with the private sector is also understanding what sort of arguments you bring to the table, which is that, yes, it makes business sense. Yes, you will see an uptick in you know, productivity. Yes, you will see a difference in the way your organizations run. Yes, you will have less yelling. This tends to be a problem that not enough people speak about, but like aggression and anger at the workplace is something both, like not both, sorry, my bad, but any gender can bring to a workplace. It's not contingent on this thing, but there is a tendency to think about it a certain way. And you will find that men feel more comfortable, you know, displaying certain kinds of behavior that no other gender would be comfortable displaying. Um, and that's very much about the way in which we've been socialized. So all of this, when you come back to it, is how do you present this to a company and say, okay, it makes good business sense for you to consider inclusion, to consider certain values. And some organizations are already beginning to do that, right? You're seeing a Zomato push for period leave. Now, even though that might be um, really far out and you have lots of women even complaining about how they're going to be treated differently, the idea is that they are changing the way in which we're thinking about um like gender at work um they are thinking about shared parental leave and they are putting forth all of these suggestions and just by doing that they are creating value for their company because people who identify with those values are going to want to align with companies like that so maybe not in the immediate sense but zomato is going to see an uptick in the number of people that are going to align themselves with it or the number of young people approaching work there just because their values align. And that's something that the pandemic has taught us, that you're going to stick with companies, you're going to stick with the private sector where you can recognize these values that mirror your own. And there's a really, really interesting article I read about this. But just overall, it is companies that are going to have those sorts of value systems that are going to make this good business decisions and good business sense in the future. And that's what I'm hoping for from the young people of India. So yeah. Labor force participation rate 
policies often make advisories that... Akshay, you're not really audible. I think there's some issue. Hello, am I audible yeah. now? Yeah. Sorry about that. About the labor force participation rate, policies often make advisories that the government itself does not follow. Say, the poor working conditions of the Asha and Anganwadi workers. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, if a law is pushed out by an institution, then there is absolutely sort of no getting away from that. Um, I really wish I knew what to say to that because it's absolutely true. The laws of the land apply to everybody, uh, every single person. And there's no sort of waffling on the conditions, even if you see the way in which um, these schemes are set up, and it's a very interesting thing to actually go ahead and read on the government website, the WCD actually puts out all of its schemes. And you'll see some of the um, salaries, for instance, right? They're from maybe 20, 25 years ago. And that was part of my job to reconsider this and to say that, look, if you're going to say, masters in social work and you're paying 10,000 rupees for a particular salary, you're clearly out of touch with the working reality of people or you're saying that this is work that they should do to the detriment of um, their ability to, to go out and earn. That's definitely something to think about. How are we responding to the fact that the world is changing? And that's something regardless of where you are, whether you're in government, whether you're in civil society. I mean, and this is not limited to government. You go to a lot of uh, NGOs and they all sort of have this peanut pay situation and they'll all tell you, yeah, but you're doing work in service of. And you'll find terrible toxic behaviors even in the CSO space. And it's quite sick because you think that this is the place that is creating the reform and it doesn't always, and it doesn't always pan out like that. Um, and young women are writing about this on Twitter. I, I've been seeing more and more um, people my age are all putting down their experiences with civil society organizations um, that are doing the exact same things. And really what we're seeing is uh, the way in which we're envisioning this sort of care work that is happening, right? Whether it's ASHA workers or Anganwadi workers or whether it's um, young people that are working in civil society in uh, non-government organizations, for instance, you're saying that because you are doing good work, that should be enough thanks for, you know, what you do and your working conditions and the way we treat you, it doesn't really matter. And nothing could be further from the truth, because if we don't start reforming precisely these institutions, with what, uh, you know, with what sort of authority do you go to the private sector and say, well, you need to, to be doing good things for people and keep your CSR money and be giving it to us for all of these things. So absolutely, I, I'm completely um, cognizant and I hear you on this. Uh, the next question is by Sanalika Rani. Like maternity leave is important, do you support menstrual leave which Somato wants to give to its female employees and the state of Bihar already gives to its female employees since the early 2000s? And should this menstrual leave be a part uh, to be considered in public policy? Okay, so the thing with, and I've, I've mentioned menstrual leave in the answer before this, but um, as someone with of a menstrual health disorder personally, I will say that um, I completely understand the push for it and the impetus for it. There is definitely a hesitance to talk about um, certain issues because, and particularly menstrual health tends to be one of those places because it's not considered polite conversation and for God only knows what reason. But I think the fact that we're having this conversation now and companies are recognizing now whether Zomato is doing it to improve its bottom line and to seem like a more authentic company because they genuinely care about the issues that are being faced by menstruators. I think the fact that this policy is even in play is important. Um, it is important to be thinking about, yes, right now it is going to affect companies. It is going to affect women at work, whether we like it or not. It is going to make companies think twice when they hire women. And that is definitely when we're talking about female labor force participation rate dropping. That is something that we really need to sort of balance out when we talk about 
um, leave. But that being said, like the fact that this is taking up mainstream attention in newspapers and magazines, and you will always find that it is a certain generation of women that is speaking up against it because they've all sort of faced the consequences of, um, you know, seeming weaker than. But I would like to believe that ours is a generation that is going to be a little bit more empathetic. I hope to God that we are. I hope that we will push for those things because it is important to be talking about what menstruators face. Um, and I say menstruators because not just women that menstruate. So, you know, these are all sort of um, things to for us to be considering um, when we're talking about menstrual leave. And I'm personally all for it. I hope that we can talk about it without shame. Right. There has been a question that's been posted by Shreya Shukla multiple times. I personally didn't want to take it. Uh, but um, don't you think having 33% reservation policy would reinforce stereotypes against women as the weaker gender? Wouldn't that be counterintuitive then? A lot of people say that it will be. And, you know, the thing is, I don't know where I stand on this. <laughs> Uh, because I do understand that the, there's a huge issue that we do face around stereotypes um, overall. But a lot of those stereotypes are also, like like I said, those are things that we're going to have to grapple with even within ourselves before we start looking outside for them. Um, yes, it will, because any kind of reservation policy anywhere in the world does create an initial upset. And it does create, I mean, we see it across the board um, but does that mean we shouldn't have reservation policies no because we see reservation policies as being social protection so yes it might reinforce stereotypes but equally um, it there is a reason you are asking for social protection right the the reason that the constitutional validity of um, the protection of women against domestic violence act was upheld um, in Supreme Court when it was challenged was because women as a class were seen as being markedly more vulnerable to violence, right? This was something that senior advocate um, Indira Jai Singh wrote about quite extensively. And I think um, affirmative action specifically is not something that we should be of any kind it should be falling under question when we're talking about social protection. I'm, I'm sorry, I completely disagree with that. That okay, it can reinforce stereotypes, but equally, who cares? If it gets women into positions of decision making and of power that they, they should by rights be in, then why not? Right. Pay parity continues to be a major struggle in most societies. In many industries, women are denied equal remuneration even when their work contribution is equal to that of men. What kind of policies can bring about a significant change in this? Yeah, so pay parity is a huge one. And I think it's also largely because, and you will see this, it's not specifically limited to India. Um, everywhere in the world, um, women earn less than men, right? On whether it's on the dollar or on the or whatever you want to, however you want to play this, there is pay parity is a problem almost everywhere, barring perhaps I think a few Scandinavian countries. And we all know what a liberal utopia that is in general. Um, but I do think the the real sort of this thing in in. in in terms of pay parity is that we don't talk about money enough and we don't talk about it openly at least and this is sort of my own understanding of India um, specifically um, because we're so hesitant to, to talk about money um, we don't always there is no transparency in the way in which this is doled out and you'd be surprised but I think the government is the one place that does have pay parity right it's the one place where there's no question of um, sort of the gender gap at least not to my knowledge it's possible that there is and i don't know about it but to my knowledge that's one place where you are seeing it um in a in a good way um but when you talk about like policies that can change this there needs to i mean clearly there can be a policy that 
comes out tomorrow and says you're not allowed to and there is already one in place i don't know if you guys know about this but i think it's 1961 there's an equal remuneration act so <laughs> legally you are not allowed to pay your female employees less or you're not allowed to pay anyone less um, than anyone else bases a gender identity and this is not something that people know about this is not something that people enforce nearly enough because these are not details that you have openly right how much x person earns in the company or how much y person earns at the same level if you did um you absolutely have recourse within the law to be accessing this um so i don't think a further policy is needed on this because there already exists a law that guarantees it for you um and that's all you need to know about this specifically when it comes to the gender pay gap that we have an equal remuneration law um, and that was something that this was a series we did with the podcast is that there are so many laws and policies that already exist in the country that we do need to be you know um, talking about and not enough people even know that they have recourse to some of these things so you know they, you don't even know that the the access is there so yeah that's definitely something to be thinking about with this we come to the end of this session thank you so much um, for being here with us i think that was a personally i really enjoyed this session and i would also like to thank everybody um, who attended and yeah thank you so much thank you and thank you for 91 people staying on for this long before your exams um, thank you thank you for having me <laughs>